Well, hello everyone, and uh, and welcome. Thank you for uh, for participating in the conference this week. My name is Caleb Wellman, and I am a biologist for the uh, USDA Wildlife Services Program here in Ohio. One major aspect of my job is is working with uh, uh, you know different uh, different local agencies, uh, communities, private property owners, uh, and providing them with technical assistance for resolving human wildlife conflicts with a whole host of species, including white-tailed deer. Over the last uh, decade or so, I have assisted numerous Northern Ohio communities, as well as park systems with implementing deer damage management programs, and have been involved with several different workshops that have been geared towards supporting community leaders in making decisions about managing white-tailed deer conflicts in their respective cities. And that's kind of where the background for this presentation was, was born out of, was many of those interactions with community leaders who uh, you know, are not trained wildlife managers, they're not trained wildlife biologists. All too often you know, do I hear questions like, how do we know if we have a deer problem in our city? Or you know, can you tell me if we have too many deer in our city? And I see communities uh, either delay taking uh, some type of management action while uh, you know, deer conflicts continue to increase in that particular city, or I see communities jumping uh, right into taking some type of management action without demonstrating a clear understanding of deer conflicts in that community. And either one of these ways can be a recipe for failure and actually addressing deer conflicts in an efficient and cost-effective manner. So with that in mind, uh, the intent of this talk today is, is just to cover some, some basic concepts related to deer damage management in urban and suburban areas and to provide a, a basic framework, if you will, for which community leaders can begin to uh, assess and, and document deer problems for their community, and to use that information to, if warranted, uh, develop effective deer damage management strategies or programs. Overabundant white-tailed deer populations are an increasing wildlife management challenge for many communities throughout the United States, uh, including numerous uh, cities here in Ohio. Deer are a, a highly adaptable species and they do very well living in and around people in our urban environments. Urbanization, suburbanization has created ideal habitat conditions for deer with increased habitat edge, abundant food sources that are available year-round, and a lack of predators and other significant sources of mortality. This has resulted in localized deer populations that can and do grow very rapidly. In fact, uh, some of the highest deer densities in the state can be found in our urban and suburban areas. We now have people encountering deer on a daily basis in places where uh, just a few decades ago it would have been rare to see a deer. And when we have humans and deer living in, in close proximity to one another, that likelihood for, for human-deer conflict or, or negative interactions with deer increases. And we're seeing this uh, you know, in many communities uh, you know, throughout Ohio here. Uh, and it seems to be a, 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 an increasing concern uh, among, among those communities. Uh, and, and they're having very real challenges in, in, in figuring out how to uh, you know, begin to, to navigate through trying to reduce those, those conflicts, those deer problems. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, you know, those communities, those community leaders uh, that are experiencing problems with, with deer have to make a relatively basic decision. And that is, you know, does that community take some type of management action or not? Uh, and in most instances, uh, we're talking about, you know, do, does that community implement some type of deer population control, try to manage or limit uh, that deer population in some capacity? It's often in getting to this point uh, where the process often stalls out or, or goes awry. I will see the initial discussions about deer in a particular community go down uh, one of two roads. One where the focus is, is solely on how those deer are going to be managed. Uh, and in particular, we're talking, uh, you know, those techniques designed to uh, reduce deer populations or stabilize deer populations. And you get into uh, to the discussion about lethal deer management techniques versus non-lethal deer management techniques. Uh, the other road has to do with, uh, you know, solely looking at the number of deer in that community or, or rather how many deer should be in that community. Uh, you know, looking just at its, its specifically numbers of deer, deer populations. And both of these roads take, take a detour and sometimes a rather long detour from actually getting to the point of addressing, uh, you know, the impacts of those deer, those, those deer problems 
uh, in that community. You know, those are the reasons that, that that everybody began discussing deer in the first place. Those 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 impacts of that that deer population. I am not going to do a thorough review of, of deer management techniques in this talk. I am sure that uh, you know most of you are familiar with what is out there in terms of those tools and management strategies for, for mitigating deer damage across a, a whole host of situations. And quite honestly, not much has changed uh, in that realm um, over the last several decades. There is no new magic deer management tool or, or technique out there that's gonna solve your, your, your deer problems uh, overnight. And that brings me to the point of, you, you know, you need to be aware that there is no quick fix to, to resolving uh, these issues or managing deer related problems in, in urban and suburban areas. Success is, is most often achieved by implementing a, a multifaceted approach uh, that uses all legal and proven techniques. And typically, some form of population management is going to be required for, for long-term solutions to deer-human conflicts, especially over uh, larger geographical scales, um, you know, such as, as many of our, our, our communities or, or cities that uh, you know, are having problems with deer. What that looks like and how effective <clears throat> that is going to be in a specific or particular community, community is going to vary based on several considerations. Uh, including the you know the scope of, of deer problems within that community, and what that community's specific deer-related goals and objectives are. Other things that come into play include you know local ordinances uh, and the size and composition of the city as well. You know things of, of this nature may dictate uh, you know what those those deer management programs look like in that community. But just be aware uh, you know that there are local conditions that do shape um, and, and drive. How, how a particular community goes about managing deer problems. And if you look back to that slide a, a couple slides ago within the headlines there, you can see that, yes, yeah, several communities are having problems with deer in Ohio, and they're all taking a, a relatively different approach, if you will, uh, in terms of, of how they're shaping or setting up those, those attempts to manage or reduce deer problems. And again, all of, all of that is based on, you know, these local considerations that, that come into play here. One of the more important concepts uh, to understand when we're talking about deer problems in, in urban and suburban areas is that you know deer problems are not defined by a particular number of deer on the landscape. Uh, you know, instead, a deer problem exists when there is a consensus among residents within that community that the deer issues facing them are, are no longer acceptable. So, in most of our urban and suburban areas. Deer problems are defined by, by human values and tolerances, you know, rather than looking at this from, from a biological perspective of, of true uh, overabundance or overpopulation of deer. Too often do I see communities delay discussions about deer until a population estimate or count is completed. And the reality is, is that that number really doesn't mean anything without some context and, and a thorough understanding of deer impacts in that community. Deer problems are not defined by a number of deer per square mile, rather they are defined by the impacts of those deer and the values of the residents they are affecting. So ultimately, uh, in the end, it is up to the, the community uh, and the residents within that community to determine when the deer population reaches a level uh, that the majority of residents are, are not willing to tolerate based on their attitudes and views uh, towards those deer and the impacts that those deer are, are having uh, in, in that, co that, that community. So again, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, managing for for a specific number of deer. I can, uh, you know, cite countless ex examples uh, just in Northeast Ohio where, uh, you know, communities are, are dealing with deer problems um, and uh, and dealing with different densities of deer. And what you'll see is, again, depending on those local considerations, those those views and, and attitudes of the residents, some communities are fine uh, at having, you know, a density of 10 to 15 deer per square mile. I've seen where some communities, uh, you know, have upwards of 35 to 40 deer per square mile, um, and, and are, uh, you know, are okay with that. Uh, you know, that level of deer is compatible with with those local considerations, uh, those residents' attitudes and, and, and views towards deer. I've been in some other communities where, uh, you know, at five deer per square mile, uh, those deer are still impacting those residents in, in, a, in a negative way. Um, in, in that community views that the, uh, you know, they still have a deer problem. So this can vary, uh, you know, widely uh, across the state, and there really isn't no specific uh, or, or magic number of deer to have in, in a community. 
So what do deer problems uh, you know, look like if we're not talking about a, a certain number of deer? Well, deer problems, uh, so again, those residents' views uh, towards, towards deer, uh, their values of deer within that community, negative interactions with deer, will typically manifest itself in an escalation of, of complaints from the community regarding the frequency and severity of deer damage issues. In most communities, it's at this point where mayors and council are receiving numerous resident complaints about excessive amounts of deer vehicle accidents, damage to people's gardens and landscaping, deer attacking people and pets, ecological damage to community parks and green spaces, as well as disease concerns. The topic of deer becomes a regular agenda item at council and committee meetings. Adding some complexity to the mix of this uh, is the fact that there is no magic number of deer that will satisfy all residents. For some, two deer may be too many, yet for others, having 15 or 30 deer in their yard might be a welcome sight. In my experience, in most communities, um, there, there does seem to be a clear majority, though, uh, that usually exists either, either one way or the other um, that you as a community leader can use to help you gauge uh, you know, when you have a deer problem and, and when to uh, maybe more importantly take some action uh, to resolve those issues. Instead of, of looking at, at, at how many deer are in the community or, or maybe how many deer should be in the community, uh, community leaders should direct their attention towards identifying and measuring the, the impacts of those deer uh, within that city. The old adage that you can't uh, manage what you don't measure is very applicable here. So again, biologically, uh, I as a biologist can, can monitor deer population levels by examining the health and, and condition of deer and the impacts um, that those deer or that number of deer are having on, on their, their habitat. Uh, when there is a true biological overpopulation of a deer population, uh, in general, the condition of those deer declines. Uh, they're basically eating themselves out of, out of house and home. There are some disease implications from that. And that number of deer are having a, a true impact on, on their habitat. They're, they're destroying that habitat. Uh, in many of our, our urban and suburban areas, um, you know, these areas tend to be able to support uh, rather elevated numbers of, of deer, uh, you know, higher deer populations, uh, especially when we look at maybe some of the more rural areas uh, of our state. Um, we can have a lot more deer in our urban and suburban areas. And we see this, and those deer are living to be uh, old, fat, and happy uh, because, again, some of those, those ideal conditions that uh, urbanization has created in terms of, of deer habitat uh, and their ability to adapt and live uh, in close proximity to people, relying on us for, uh, you know, human subsidized food sources and, and things of that nature. So we have a kind of an artificially created environment that can support elevated numbers of, of deer. Again, in these areas, we're talking about uh, sociological or cultural issues or impacts that that deer, that deer population is having, um, you know, on the environment. So we're talking about people's acceptance of deer and deer related impacts. And this can be a little bit more difficult to gauge than it is uh, when we're talking about a true biological overpopulation of deer. So when we look at this, formally identifying or assessing whether a deer problem exists in the community um, should take a deep dive into uh, looking at those issues that, that people are, are, are truly concerned about. You know, what kinds of deer related problems are, are occurring? Uh, you know, is there a public safety component in terms of deer vehicle accidents? Are your residents having true issues with deer? Is there damage to, to gardens and landscaping? Um, you know, things of that nature is what you should be digging down into and, and trying to, to capture or gather some data on. You know, when and where are these problems are, are occurring? Is it something that is, is just located in a certain, uh, you know, a portion of your city or is it community wide? Who is experiencing these problems and how severe are those problems? You know, getting to the root of those questions uh, will give you that, that foundational information, help you actually define, uh, you know, the nature, uh, the significance of, of deer problems, deer impacts within your community. And you can use this information um, to kind of move forward as this will be foundational to um, this process of, 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 of deer, uh, deer management or deer damage management. You'll note that, uh, you know, I, I'm not just talking, uh, you know, there are other mechanisms, other data points to be looking at rather than just uh, the number of deer uh, within the political boundary of, of your community. 
Uh, that's not to say that, you know, at some point in time, having an idea of the number of deer you're, you're, you're dealing with is, is not important. It is another data point, another piece of this puzzle, if you will. Uh, but especially early on, um, you know, if you're just getting to the point where, where deer are becoming a problem in your community or, or people are starting to voice their concerns, um, you know, knowing the number of deer that are there right off the bat, um, you know, really doesn't add anything to the, to the conversation, especially in terms of looking at these, these 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 actual impacts of those deer, uh, you know, these are the things that, that people are having trouble with. These are the deer problems. Um, eventually down the road, uh, you know, the number of deer uh, or, or deer population estimates can be useful um, in helping you shape a management program. Uh, and, and again, just another data point that helps paint the picture of deer and deer impacts uh, within a particular community. One note on, on deer surveys, um, you know, you need to view these things, uh, you know, if you're, if you're having a deer survey or white-tailed deer count done, uh, is, is just a, a, a snapshot in time, if you will. We know deer, you know, do move in and out of cities, so there can be some, some fluctuation there. Also, deer uh, will move around seasonally um, and, and have different patterns related to seasonal movements and food and things of that nature. So these populations can fluctuate. Um, you know, even within it, within a given year, several, several times. So it's just a snapshot in time, if, if you will. Um, and it's very difficult to, to actually do a complete sen census on deer. Um, so these are just, uh, just again, just trends, just indexes of, of, of the number of deer within the community for that given time that that, that survey was, was completed. A citizen survey is a good initial step to take, um, and, and especially if you know mayor or council are, are beginning to receive a lot of complaints about deer. And this can help community leaders, um, you know, take a, a good assessment of, of how uh, deer are impacting a community and, and, and what their residents' thoughts are on deer. Survey questions should be designed uh, to objectively measure residents' attitudes towards deer, but also gather some information on the type of, of, of deer conflicts that are occurring within that community, the severity of those issues, uh, the duration of those conflicts with deer. And you can also use these to gauge um, you know, what, what level of knowledge that your residents have on, on deer biology, deer ecology, uh, as well as, as, as deer conflicts. And you can also use this to, uh, you know, get a sense as, uh, as to what your residents feel is the best approach to try to manage or, or reduce uh, uh, deer problems within the community. And in particular with those techniques that are uh, geared towards managing deer populations. These types of surveys should be widely publicized and residents should be encouraged to provide input and have this open dialogue with you, the community leader. Uh, one caution around the interpretation of survey results uh, you know responses can be influenced by by many things including local news stories social media uh, and, and things of that nature and, and as, as i'm sure you're aware deer do tend to be a, a a local hot topic in the news as well as on social media but in general this technique does provide some some good insight uh, towards the residents views of deer within a community, and it does highlight the major deer conflicts that uh, that people are are concerned about. Repeating this type of survey on an annual basis can be a good practice, as it allows decision makers to keep their finger on the pulse of deer problems in the community, and can be used to assess you know whether or not management actions are having the desired uh, impact on actually reducing deer conflicts. Public safety is always at the forefront of, of most community leader decisions. Uh, and as such, deer vehicle accidents are often the, uh, the most cited deer conflict across communities as they do pose a, a significant safety concern and can be very costly. A concerted effort should be made to report and collect deer vehicle accident data uh, in a consistent manner, especially if this is a, a primary driving uh, issue or primary deer conflict within your community. We should be looking at uh, you know, deer problems as no different than any other uh, public service problem uh, that you may um, you know, be tackling as an elected official or community leader. Collecting this data in a consistent manner may sound simple enough, but I have seen many communities uh, struggle with this or, uh, you know, just not put that concerted effort into, um, you know, collecting this data. 
Uh, deer vehicle accident data should be collected and reported uh, in a standalone database if possible. I have seen, uh, you know, many different situations over the years, uh, you know, from communities that, you know, report this data uh, with all other uh, police inc incidents, police reports. I've also seen some communities that, you know, uh, maybe write down deer vehicle accidents on a, on a napkin and, uh, and throw it in a filing cabinet. Um, so, you know, having a standalone database, especially when we're, you know, using this as a major metric in terms of evaluating deer problems and evaluating our, our management actions to reduce those, those problems uh, is important so that we can, we can pull this data and analyze it as needed. Ideally, deer vehicle accident data would be collected by the same city department, uh, be it the police department, the service department from, from year to year. And again, um, you know, there, there can be some challenges to that as well, depending on the, the, the layout and composition of your city. Uh, you may have uh, multiple different roadways, road types uh, that have, you know, jur jurisdiction of other uh, agencies or entities. Uh, and there may be some, some holes uh, in terms of collecting, getting that clear snapshot of, of deer vehicle accidents. So there may be some things that uh, you as the community leader are unaware of, again, just depending on the layout and jurisdictions of roadways within that, uh, within that community. So there can be some challenges there, there can be some missing information, and really it's important um, to you know, capture uh, this data as best as we can, especially when we're specifically talking about deer problems and, and managing uh, or reducing those, those problems. Uh, if you put, uh, you know, garbage data in, you're going to get garbage results out. Just again, emphasizing this, this consistency in reporting. Uh, at a minimum, the recommended data to include is uh, the date, the time of day, uh, the exact location of the accident. Were there any injuries? What were the severity of those injuries? Was there any damage to the vehicle? Uh, again, just putting um, some meat uh, to those actual white-tailed deer conflicts, if you will. In terms of uh, uh, deer damage management, some other data that may be useful, especially if you're, you're, you're taking some type of management action to, to manage deer populations within that community, is, uh, is some biological data from those deer that are involved uh, in accidents. Uh, and this would be simple data such as the relative age and sex of the deer involved. And again, this can be useful um, for, uh, for, for actual on the ground management uh, of deer populations. Mapping deer vehicle accident data can really help you paint a picture as to, to how white-tailed deer are impacting your community and where those impacts are, are the greatest. And again, this can help tailor um, you know, how you are, 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 are going about trying to, to manage uh, the, those conflicts. Deer vehicle accidents should be analyzed on an annual basis to look for trends in locations, time of year, um, etc. And again, certainly this can aid in implementing management actions. It is often used to determine, you know, whether or not those management actions are, are, are working. If deer vehicle accidents is one of the primary driving factors of you as a community taking action to manage deer, uh, then those management actions uh, should be resulting in, in a reduction of deer vehicle accidents. Uh, if not, then uh, you should be taking a, a look at uh, you know, why this is occurring and, uh, and adapting your, your management actions accordingly. So once, you know, the data ha has been collected, uh, you've defined deer problems within your community, you have that, that foundational background information on, on what is going on and, uh, and have a good idea there. And, and you have a general consensus as a community that yes, a deer problem exists. Community leaders should begin to uh, um, you know, focus on establishing some clearly defined uh, goals with measure, measurable objectives for, for managing uh, deer problems, deer conflicts within that community. Again, this should be looked at as no different than any other uh, public service problem you are trying to tackle. Goals and objectives should relate directly back to those deer problems, those deer conflicts that have been identified as being uh, most important to the community. Uh, this is another area where uh, I see community leaders struggle, and uh, uh, um, lots of people actually struggle with the development of, of good uh, goals and objectives that will help uh, you know, shape uh, those management actions that you take. One way to describe a goal or goals is that they uh, should reflect ultimately what you want to achieve in the community um, in terms of, of deer and deer damage management. You'll note that goals don't have to be uh, inherently measurable 
um, and, and most often they are not, without some connection to, to, to an objective. Uh, I look at objectives as kind of the, the meat and potatoes of all of this. Uh, objectives should reflect those, those specific outcomes uh, that are needed to, to ultimately achieve your, your, your overarching goal. Objectives are measurable and should have a defined completion date. Uh, they should also be uh, relevant and attainable and again be linked directly back to your goals. By having clearly articulated objectives, um, you know, this lends itself to doing a, a thorough evaluation of possible deer management techniques. So depending on, on these goals and objectives that you develop, um, they can point you in the direction or the right direction in terms of uh, your assessment of, of management techniques. And in particular, when we're talking about uh, management techniques geared toward uh, re reducing deer populations, stabilizing deer populations. You know, is deer population reduction the only way to, to achieve uh, your desired management goals and objectives? Uh, there may be some other management alternatives that, that might work and that you should consider uh, implementing in terms of, of reducing deer problems within your community. In some cases, deer management goals can be met without actually uh, removing or managing deer populations. For example, uh, you know, using different exclusion techniques to protect, say, a, a sensitive plant community within uh, one of your parks, or uh, if there's an identified hotspot for deer, deer vehicle accidents along a, a certain highway segment, uh, you know, maybe there are some fencing or exclusion techniques you can use uh, to reduce deer vehicle accidents in that location. Uh, if uh, you know it is decided that yes, the deer population uh, needs to be managed, needs to be reduced. You know, then what methods can help you uh, achieve that that management goal most efficiently, and maybe more importantly, most cost effectively? I have seen where some communities will assign deer issues to a particular committee, be it the, a safety committee, a recreation committee, uh, to work through this process of evaluating deer conflicts, uh, gathering that background information and then working on formulating uh, you know, good management goals and objectives. Other communities have formed or taken a more traditional community-based deer management approach, and they'll form a, a white-tailed deer task force uh, that is made up of representatives from all of the, the varied interest groups uh, or stakeholders within that community that, that have uh, you know, something to say about deer. Uh, either way can be effective. The key here is going to be you know, having that transparency, that open dialogue, open communication uh, with, with, with everybody that, ha that has those vested interests and, and keeping those discussions uh, about deer within the community focused on the actual deer impacts and not getting uh, bogged down going one, down one of those two roads I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Remember, again, in most of our urban and suburban situations, deer are being managed for, for sociological reasons, uh, cultural reasons. There's that human dimensions aspect of, of deer damage in our urban and suburban areas. And as such, everyone should have some input as to, uh, you know, to what their deer problems are and some input as to uh, you know, how those deer should be managed. Uh, again, depending on the layout, the structure of your community, uh, ultimately it is up to you, the community leader, to maybe make those decisions or, or help guide those, de those decisions in the end. If it is decided that management actions are needed, um, then these, these objectives and goals that you develop can be used to evaluate program successes and can also be used to modify or adapt management strategies as needed. Remember, uh, you know, communities are not managing deer because there is some number of deer per square mile present. Uh, they are managing deer because the residents agree that the number of deer vehicle accidents, the damage to gardens and landscaping, or some other measure is unacceptable to them. So ultimately, our objectives, your objectives, should reflect those specific community deer impacts or problems, and, uh, and, and that's what your management or your, your management action should be working towards meeting. Another thing to consider uh, as you're, you're working through this process is to, uh, you know, don't hesitate to consult with, with professional wildlife management agencies in the state. It can be uh, most beneficial to loop these folks into council or committee meetings as early on in the process as possible to get their perspectives on the community's deer problems, um, as well as their perspectives on, uh, on, on different deer management techniques uh, and things of that nature. 
I mentioned this early, early on, but community leaders are rarely trained wildlife uh, managers or wildlife biologists, so it's okay to seek guidance. Uh, professional wildlife managers and biologists can be used to provide factual information on deer ecology, uh, biology and behavior, or give you more information on, on deer impacts to human health and safety or natural resources. Uh, in Ohio, both the Division of Wildlife and USDA Wildlife Services have a wealth of knowledge on, on deer damage management techniques and can detail the efficacy of those, those methods and, uh, and how they may be applicable in a given city. One other important uh, factor to consider is that there is a, a legal aspect of, of deer management. The Ohio Division of Wildlife has the uh, regulatory authority over deer in the state. Uh, so you need to be aware that there are certain deer management actions uh, that may require permits or some other type of authorization from them. So they will need to be involved in the conversation uh, at some point in the game. And, and, and like I said, I would urge you to get these folks involved uh, as early in the process as, as possible. Lastly, you know, if a community decides that, uh, you know, yes, it has a deer problem and that, uh, yes, some form of population management is going to be needed, um, you need to keep in mind that, that once you, you start uh, managing deer or, or a deer population, there really is no, no stopping point. Uh, deer populations can quickly rebound, um, you know, if left unmanaged. Uh, as new deer are born every year uh, and deer can and do move in and out of the city, uh, so, you know, management would be required or, or typically would be required every year. What can change is, you know, the scope and intensity of those management efforts. I always recommend that if a community has the, the resources, it's most, most wise or it would be wise to put the, that maximum effort into management uh, at the beginning of the project. This typically proves to be the most effective approach over the long run in terms of, of cost and actually successfully reaching uh, deer management goals in, in a timely manner. And speaking of cost and, and budget, regardless of how you manage deer uh, in the community, there is, there is some level of cost that's going to be associated with that. And in particular, when you're talking about uh, you know, those programs that are, that are reducing the number of deer on the landscape or trying to, to stabilize white-tailed deer populations. So accounting for those reoccurring costs of deer management uh, is sometimes overlooked. Uh, deer management, again, is not a one-time effort. It's often going to, going to take several years to work towards the changes in deer impacts that a community desires. I once uh, was in a, in, a, in a council meeting talking about deer where I had a, a very wise councilman frame it best. He said that deer management is like snow removal. It's a service that uh, you know his citizens want and one that he's going to budget for every year. And this is, uh, you know, I thought was just a, a good take on uh, on uh, deer management and, and deer problems, you know, especially here in Ohio, um, where, where uh, you know, this is a common problem that many communities face. It should be viewed as no different than, than any other uh, public service problem that, you know, you as elected officials or community leaders are tasked with with trying to, to solve or, or uh, you know, figure out for, for your, your constituents. So with that, I just want to wrap up with a, a quick summary slide. You know, the management of white-tailed deer conflicts in, in urban and suburban areas can be very complex. Remember that deer problems are not defined by a certain number of deer within the political boundaries of a community. Rather, those problems are defined by the residents' attitudes and values towards deer uh, living in that, that city. You know, how are those deer impacting your residents? We typically see people's acceptance of deer-related problems decrease as deer populations increase. Managing deer populations for, for sociological or cultural reasons can be challenging. As such, it becomes imperative that the community have a, a thorough understanding of those deer impacts affecting residents, including having mechanisms in place to quantify and clearly communicate those impacts to the public. If it is determined that, it, yes, a deer problem exists, then it is necessary to work as a community to develop clear management goals and objectives defining what deer impacts are tolerable in, this, in that, that specific community. This step is foundational as your goals and objectives should be used to help you evaluate what management actions will be most appropriate uh, and effective in a, in a particular community. If a management action is taken, then the goals and objectives that were developed can be used to help you evaluate what impacts those management actions are having. Deer damage management should be looked at as a cyclical process that requires annual review and an assessment. 
and modifications to your management actions should be made accordingly. Lastly, again, it is understood that mayors, council members, committee members are not trained wildlife managers or biologists. Don't hesitate to engage with wildlife professionals for technical assistance. And again, this can be most beneficial to seek or loop these folks in as early in the process as possible. And with that, I have my, uh, my contact information up on this last slide here. Uh, again, my name is Caleb Wellman. I am our staff wildlife biologist out of our, our northern district. So that's located up in Sandusky, Ohio. And myself and, and John Paul Seaman, the district supervisor out of that office, are responsible for uh, our program's activities in, in Ohio's northern 39 counties. Uh, my counterpart uh, out of our, our, our Columbus district office is Tommy Butler, and the uh, district supervisor out of that office is, is Jeff Pelk. Uh, so if you happen to fall within uh, you know, the remaining southern counties, those counties outlined in red on the map, uh, that would be a good point of contact for you. And again, USDA Wildlife Services is uh, you know, the federal government's wildlife damage management agency. So we are here to provide, provide you with, with technical assistance uh, you know, for, for dealing with those, those human wildlife conflicts with not just only deer, but any other issues you may have or, or have questions on. So, you know, feel free to utilize us uh, as, as, a, as a resource or uh, at least to get you the information to, to make good, uh, sound uh, wildlife damage management decisions. Uh, so with that, I thank everyone for your, your attention. I will be available on the, uh, the 19th following the, the keynote speaker. Uh, you know, should there be any questions or follow-up discussions on this presentation. Uh, again, thank you very much.